Bible. <laughs> the fruit of the spirit. Have you ever heard of the fruit of the spirit? Um, you mean fruit like a pineapple? <laughs> Not quite. The fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. But those aren't fruit. Oh, but they are. Let me explain. Have you ever seen an apple tree? What kind of fruit grows on an apple tree? Apples. Yep. An apple seed grows into a tree that grows more fruit. More apples. I really like apples. Paul talked a lot about fruit in his letters. He knew that all of Jesus' followers needed help to grow fruit like a tree. Like an apple tree. Exactly. Just like a seed grows into a tree that grows into fruit, new followers of Jesus need to grow in their faith. Oh, I get it. In the Bible, Paul talked about what grows out of sin. Hmm, it's probably nothing good. Bad things grow out of sin, like selfishness, anger, and greed. Uh-oh. But Paul also talked about what grows from the Spirit of God. Oh, that's got to be different than what grows from sin. It is. When we follow Jesus and are filled with God's Spirit, we grow good fruit that shows what God is like. The fruit of an apple tree is an apple. The fruit of the Spirit is... Oh, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Yes, when we walk with Jesus, God's Spirit grows good fruit in our lives. Instead of anger, we show love. Instead of being greedy, we share. That is much better fruit. It is. There was one person who showed all of this fruit perfectly. That person was perfectly loving, perfectly kind, perfectly good. Can you guess who it was? Jesus? Yes. That's why when we follow Jesus, the Spirit of God will make us more like Jesus. And we will grow good fruit. Now. Just like a tree and its fruit grow slowly, becoming like Jesus takes time. We can become more like Jesus little by little every day. Like when we... Oh, read the Bible? Yes, and also this. Go to church? Yep, church is a place where we meet with other Jesus followers to learn more about God, sing and praise God, and help others. And one of the best ways to become more like Jesus is by... Praying. Right. Prayer is taking time to talk to God and listen to Him too. When we ask God to help us and then practice these things, we will become... More and more like Jesus. Yes! And following Jesus doesn't just mean following rules. It means getting to know Him and trusting that He knows what's best. Then the more we grow to love Him, the more the Holy Spirit changes our hearts so we want to do the right things. So we can... Grow good fruit every day, like love, joy, Peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The Fruit of the Spirit. more Laugh and Grow Bible? What do you mean? Sign up for Minnow and get more Bible stories and loads more amazing shows. 
Wow! How cool is that? Minnow is a great place to stream Christian shows for kids. Amazing! Download the Minnow app and start your free trial today. Yay! Minnow Laugh and Grow Bible! <laughs> Creation! In the beginning, there was God. Nothing else. No trees, no seas, no whales or snails, or bats or cats. No puppies or guppies? Right. No stars or Mars, no human beings, not anything. Just God. But wasn't he kind of lonely? I sure would have been. <laughs> Me too. But God wasn't alone in all that nothingness. You see, God is like us in some ways. God thinks and feels and acts, but in other ways, he is very different. What do you mean, different? Well, for one thing, God is everywhere, all the time. Everywhere? Here, there, everywhere, all at the same time. Wow, that is different. And he knows everything. Everything? Every single thing. Wowee, he sure is smart. Yes, he is. And he is never, ever wrong. Oh, he sure is not like me or anyone I know. <laughs> You're right. And there's one other thing that makes God absolutely different than anyone else. And this one's kind of tricky. What's that? God is more than one. There is one God and there are three persons in God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Three persons, one God. Wait, what? There is one God, but there are three persons in God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Three persons, one God. Um, that's a little... Hard to understand? I know. I told you it was tricky. But that is why God wasn't lonely. Because he wasn't alone. There is love within God. There is friendship within God. There is family within God. That is amazing. He is amazing. And one day, this amazing God decided, it's time to begin. So he started making stuff. And boom, all of a sudden there were stars, planets, galaxies. Wow. And God said, Very good. Then he picked one particular planet and said, Watch this. God made the oceans, mountains, plants, and trees that grow. Tiny little leafy ones smaller than a pebble and big giant ones that climb toward the sun. God said, Very good. But he wasn't done. Next, he made all kinds of... Swimmy creatures. Crawly creatures. <laughs> Birds. And whales. Gentle sloths. And woolly mammoths. All the creatures God made were amazing. <laughs> Some so very short. And others so very tall. But something was missing. Really? What could possibly be missing? None of the creatures were like God. They couldn't think the way God thought, feel the way God felt, act the way God acted, and these creatures couldn't join the friendship that God had within himself. So, what did God do? He said, Watch this. 
And then God made something super special. A creature that could think and feel and act just like he could think and feel and act. A creature that could join God's family. What was it? What did he make? He made a man and a woman. God made us. Then he looked at everything he had made and God said, Very good. <laughs> very, very good indeed. Beginning, God created a great big universe with tons of shining stars, a bright burning sun, and do you remember what else? Yep, planets. Right. Then he took a planet and filled it with so many special things. Earth. That's where we live. Right again. And on the Earth, he made two very special creatures. Oh, oh, I know. Um, a whale and a dinosaur. No, those aren't the creatures I'm talking about. Keep guessing. A platypus and sloth? A dog and a cat? A lizard and a blobfish? Oh, I give up. A man and a woman. I knew it. Well, actually I didn't, but now I do. <laughs> God named the man. Adam. And the woman he named... Eve. Now, the Earth was a pretty wild place. So, God planted a garden for Adam and Eve to live in. Wow! How cool is that? God called the garden Eden. And inside the garden, Adam and Eve had everything they needed. And best of all... We, we are, are friends, friends with, with God. God. But friendship only works if there is something very important. Trust. If Adam and Eve wanted to continue to be God's friends, they needed to trust Him. They needed to listen to God. Trusting God should be easy, since He loves us so much. And He knows everything. And it was easy. For a while. Just a while? You see, there was this one tree. I thought there were lots of trees in the garden. Oh, there were. But there was this one particular tree in the garden that was different. God said, Don't eat from that tree. So they had a gazillion trees with all the fruit they could want. And just one they couldn't touch? Yep. Just that one? Uh-huh. <laughs> Easy peasy. It should have been. And Adam and Eve were just fine doing as God had told them, up until a new voice showed up in the garden. A new voice? Who was it? It was the voice of the enemy of God, and it was coming from a sneaky, tricky snake that said, Are you sure, God said, you can't eat the fruit from that tree? Oh, we're, we're sure. sure. God said, that if we eat that fruit, we will die. And then the snake did something that no one had ever <laughs> done before in God's beautiful world. The snake lied. <laughs> you will surely not die. Huh? No. If you eat of that tree, you'll become wise and smart like God. That doesn't sound right. So for sure they stopped listening to the sneaky snake and walked away, right? <sighs> no. What? No way! They thought about what the snake said. It would be great to be as wise as God. Then we'd know everything too. 
What to do? What to do? What did they do? Adam and Eve decided to trust the snake and go their own way. They did what God told them not to do. They ate the fruit. <laughs> oh no, 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 no! At that moment, sin entered God's wonderful world. You see, sin is when we ignore God and choose our own way, just like Adam and Eve did. That sneaky snake! He lied to Adam and Eve, and they listened to him instead of God. This is a terrible story. Hmm. Yes, that snake was terribly <laughs> sneaky. And since Adam and Eve sinned, they had to leave the garden. But don't worry, the story's not over yet. It isn't? What happened next? God had a plan. He loved his creation, and he wasn't going to let some sneaky old snake spoil it. What that sneaky snake didn't know was that God was going to do something very special to save the world from sin and make things right again. I knew God wouldn't let that snake ruin everything. What happened to Adam and Eve? I sure do. Adam and Eve decided to trust the sneaky snake instead of God. And because of that, something really, really bad happened. Yes, sin entered the world. Sin is when we turn away from God and say, I don't care what you say, God. I'm going to do things my way. See, we can't be close to God when we turn away from Him. Right. Wrong way. The sneaky snake knew that if he could get Adam and Eve to sin, then they couldn't be close to God. What a sneaky thing to do. Sneaky and bad. Because sin gets us into trouble. Hmm. This sign says God's way, but that way looks better. I'm going to go my own way. Oh, that must have hurt. And sin brings hurt, too. Because of their sin, Adam and Eve had to leave the garden. They couldn't be God's friends anymore. They had to live in the wild world, all by themselves. The wonder of God's garden was no longer a part of their lives. We shouldn't have eaten that fruit. Oh, now you tell me. Where were you when I was being tempted? Well, uh, I was right there! Exactly! <laughs> Just as I planned. God was very sad to see Adam and Eve living apart from him because of their sin, and to eventually see sin spread to their kids, and then their kids, and then their kids. Sin wrecked everything. It did. But guess what? God had a plan for us. Oh, good. Oh, triple good. What was it? A rescue plan. God had a plan to make things right. You mean by sending Jesus? Yes, to save Adam and Eve and their kids, and their kids' kids, and their kids' kids' kids, all the way down to us. Yippee! God's plan saves us from three things. The stain of sin, the power of sin, and the presence of sin. What does that even mean? First, he wants to save us from the stain of sin. When we choose to sin and turn away from God, we have the stain of sin on us. But Jesus washes away our stain of sin and changes us into people who want to be close to Him. Right. Second, 
God wants to save us from the power of sin. The more we sin, the easier it is to keep on sinning. And soon, sin takes over our lives. But Jesus gives us the power to ignore the whispers of sin and live with peace and joy and love. That's way better than sin. It sure is. And third, even though God saves us from the stain of sin and the power of sin, we still live with the presence of sin. The presence of sin means we still live in a world where sin is all around us. Tears and hurt, selfishness and meanness. God wants to save us from the presence of sin. Uh, how? When the time is right, God will make it so his family can live in the wonderful world the way he meant it to be. But when will that happen? We don't know yet. When God says the time is right. So what happened with sin back then? God saw that sin was spreading. His beautiful world was drowning in sin. God knew there was only one way to stop his world from drowning in sin. What was that? Drown the sin. Adam and Eve had to leave the Garden of Eden and settle in a new place. Yes, because they sinned. They went their own way instead of God's way. Yep, and after a while they had kids. And then their kids had kids. Grandkids! And their grandkids had great-grandkids. Then the great-great-grandkids had kids. And as all those people spread around the world, Something else was spreading, too. Sin. People were choosing their own way instead of God's way. Fighting, stealing, lying and hurting each other, and making God's world a very ugly place. Until finally, God said, Enough. It's time to start over. Start over? How? God picked one person to start his world over again. Noah! Noah was a righteous man. He tried very hard to make right choices. In a world where everyone was doing their own thing, Noah was always ready to do what God asked. He had been practicing listening to God and being obedient for a long time. More than 500 years. How could anyone be that old? <laughs> People lived a long time back then. Are you all right? I was thinking about the candles on his birthday cake. Happy birthday! <laughs> I see. So God said to Noah, I want you to build a boat. What's a boat? A thing you can float in if there's a flood. What's a flood? It's when water covers everything. It's why you need a boat. How big? Big enough for your family and some animals. Uh, how many animals? All of them. Two of every kind. <laughs> then God gave him plans for building the big boat. Noah was already so old. Building a boat that big would take a long time. Right. It took Noah and his family years and years and years. Hey, Dad, are we done yet? Not yet. Now are we done? Nope. On top of that, Noah's neighbors probably came by to laugh at him. So it's called a boat. And it's for floating on water? Yep. 
<laughs> There's no water anywhere. Poor Noah. He was just doing what God told him. Yes. He wanted to be God's friend even if everyone else thought he was silly. <laughs> Finally, one day, a drop fell from the sky. Hey! Then another, and another, and another. And then... The animals started to come? Yep. God sent them to Noah, and Noah packed them all into his big, big boat. Now are we done? Then God closed the door. We are. The rain continued to come down, harder and harder. Suddenly, having a boat looked like a pretty good idea. The water rose higher and higher. God covered the land with water so that all the fighting and hurting died. But so did most of God's creation. That's sad. It was very sad. It rained and poured for 40 days. And Noah's big, big boat floated on the water 50 days, 60 days. 100 days, 150 days. That is a long time. It was. Then, finally, the water started to go down, 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 down. Until one day, Noah's big, big boat came to rest on top of a mountain. And God said, Let's start again. So, Noah and his family, plus a bunch of seasick animals, walked out of the big, big boat into a clean, fresh world. I have placed a rainbow in the sky as my promise that I will never again flood the earth. It was time to start again. <laughs> In the days when Israel was ruled by judges, there was a young woman named... Ruth. And she lived in a country called Moab. Moab? Yep. It was right next to Israel. So, they were like neighbors. Right. Now, Ruth was married to a man named Malan, who had a brother named Killian, who married a woman named Orpah. Malan and Killian were the sons of Naomi and Elimelech. Killy, uh, Eli, Elim, uh, okay. Those names are really hard to say. They are. People had very interesting names back then. But those names aren't the hardest part of this story. Oh, no. Is the story sad? It starts out that way. Oh. Before they were married, Malin and Killian were living in Moab with their mom and dad because there was a famine in Israel. Do you know what that is? Oh, yeah. A famine is when there isn't enough food. Right. And that's where the story gets sad. What happened? After they moved to Moab, Elimelech died. That's so sad. Yes, it is. But then, something even sadder happened. What was it? A little while after they married Ruth and Orpah, Malin and Killian died too. Oh no! So Naomi, Orpah, and Ruth were left all alone? Right. What did they do? Naomi was very sad, and she decided, I have no sons, and I'm too old to work. 
So I better go back to Israel, where I'm from. But you, Orpa and Ruth, stay here in Moab, where you have family and friends. So Naomi said a teary goodbye to Orpa and Ruth and started her journey. But soon after, she realized that Ruth was following her. What are you doing? I'm going to Israel with you. With me? Why? You're my mother-in-law, and I love you. I want to make sure you're going to be okay. But what about your family? I will love your family like my own, and I will love your God. That is so amazing! Ruth was willing to give up everything for Naomi. That's right! God really loves it when we show love like that. Oh, thank you, Ruth. So off they went. Together. Yes, and when they were in Israel, they met a man named Boaz. Boaz had a nice house and a lot of land and plenty of food. And I love God. Yes, Boaz loved God. Boaz heard how Ruth had left her family and country to take care of Naomi. So, Boaz decided he should help them. That is so nice. How did he help? Well, first Boaz let Ruth pick food from his fields for free, so that she and Naomi would have plenty to eat. Wow! Not only that, Boaz offered to make Ruth his wife, so she could have a home and family again. Double wow! And that's not all that Boaz did for them. What? What else did he do? He redeemed the land that used to belong to Naomi and her husband. Redeemed? What does that mean? Redeem means to buy back, to pay the price so something or someone can be free. So, Boaz bought back the land that used to belong to Naomi. And gave it to her as a present. I love this! The story of Ruth and Naomi reminds us about God's rescue plan. Just like Boaz had to pay a price to redeem Naomi's land, many years later, someone would be born in Ruth's family who would pay the price to redeem the whole world from sin. Wait a minute! Do you mean Jesus? That's right! Jesus, our Redeemer! Long time ago, in a place called Persia, there lived a king. Me, King Xerxes. Xerxes? Yep, a tough name and, well, kind of a tough king. Why was he so tough? He had a bad temper. What? Who said that? Get rid of them! Whoa, he does have a temper. Well, King Xerxes needed a queen. So, he searched throughout the land for the best queen of all. No, 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 no. Hey! Who are you? Esther. Now, Esther was an orphan which means she had no mother or father. She lived with her cousin. Mordecai. He worked for King Xerxes at his palace. Both Mordecai and Esther were Jewish. Jewish? What does that mean? You see, God's people were called the Israelites because... They were the children of Israel. Right. Well, there came a time that Israel split in two. The southern half was called Judah, and the people from Judah were called... Jews! Okay, I get it. 
Now, the Jewish people were not very popular in King Xerxes' land, and he didn't know that Esther was a Jew. He just knew that... She is so pretty and kind! I love her! In fact, he loved her so much that he made Esther queen. Oh, what a nice story. Well, not so much. Really? Why? Things got complicated. You see, King Xerxes had a friend named Haman. Yes, yes. Like Haman. At least you won't forget me. Haman didn't like the Jews at all. And he especially didn't like Mordecai. Because Mordecai would never, ever, ever bow down to him. Finally, Haman got so fed up with Mordecai that he went to see the king. Oh, Haman! Hey, king! Oh, uh, I mean, uh, your highness. I have something important to tell you. Haman lied to the king and said that the Jews were troublemakers and the land would be better off without them. Oh, no! I hope the king didn't listen to him. He did! The king signed a law that said all the Jewish people would be killed. That's scary! Did Esther pack her bags and go? No. No? Mordecai had a plan. You have to talk to the king. Esther was scared. If someone went to the king without an invitation, you could be killed. But Mordecai said, Maybe this is why God allowed you to become queen. Esther, you can save your people. So what did she do? Esther gathered her courage and prepared a feast. A feast? Why? She invited the king and Haman, and just as they were starting to enjoy the meal, she told on Haman. She said, King Xerxes, someone is going to kill my whole family and me. The king was surprised. What? Who would want to kill my queen? That man. Haman? He plans to kill all the Jewish people. And I, I am a Jew. Like I said, King Xerxes had a temper, and he said, Amen! Whatever you were going to do to the Jews will be done to you. No, no, no! No, please! I'm sorry! That was the last time anyone had to worry about Haman. Wow! God really used Esther's bravery in a big way! Yes, he did! God used the bravery of Esther, an orphan girl who became queen, to save the children of Israel. Many years ago, Israel had a big problem. Really? What was it? Their enemy came to attack them. That is a big problem. So, King Saul, the leader of Israel, sent out a messenger to ask for help throughout the land. The messenger passed by a town where a man named Jesse lived with his big, strong sons. <gasps> The Philistines are attacking, and King Saul needs brave and mighty men to fight. Well, when Jesse's sons heard that, they said, Brave and mighty? That's us! So off they all went, all except for their little brother, David. I take care of the sheep. <laughs> David was too young and too small to go to war. So, instead of fighting, 
David brought food to his brothers. One day, while he was visiting them, David saw a big, huge Philistine. Was he one of the Philistines attacking Israel? Yes, and his name was... Goliath. I'm the baddest, biggest, strongest guy around. The Philistine leader said, If your strongest man can beat our strongest man, we will be your slaves. But if our strongest man can beat your strongest man, you will be our slaves. The Israelite soldiers were really scared. But someone had to fight Goliath. Who's brave enough to fight? I will. You? You're just a kid! God has helped me save our sheep from a lion and a bear. And God will help me save Israel from Goliath and the Philistines. Well, it sounded... Crazy! But no one else volunteered. So, King Saul said... All right, here, use my sword. Uh-oh. Uh, it's too heavy. I'll just use this. A slingshot? I use this slingshot to protect my sheep from lions and bears. And I'll use it to protect us from the Philistines. Then, David picked up five smooth stones and walked out onto the battlefield. <sighs> he was such a nice kid. Israel announced that they were sending their champion out to meet Goliath. So, the giant Philistine turned to meet him. Where is he? Right here. You? <laughs> I'm going to feed you to the birds. Goliath! 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 David must have been so scared. Maybe, but David trusted God and said, This is God's battle. Oh, yeah? Well, this is my spear. You come at me with your big spear and strong armor, but I come with the power of my big, strong God. And just then, David slung a stone through the air and... <laughs> Hit Goliath right between, between the eyes! eyes. Uh-oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> so Israel was safe. And who did God use? Not big, strong King Saul or his army. Not Jesse's warrior sons. It was David because he trusted God. And when we trust God with everything, God can use us to do amazing things. Even if we are small. That's right. Remember what a prophet is. Someone who delivers messages from God. Right. Usually, prophets were excited to deliver God's message. Yes, Lord. I'll do that right away. But this is a story about a prophet who was not. His name was... Jonah. Jonah was a prophet in Israel. And one day, God gave him a new message to share. Jonah. I have a message for you to deliver. Yes, God, right away. Where in Israel do you want me to go? I'm ready. This message is not for Israel. It's for Nineveh. Nineveh? I want you to tell them to stop being mean. You're kidding, right? You better get going. Jonah was confused. I'm a prophet for Israel. Not Nineveh. 
the people of Nineveh are mean bullies and... And what if they listen to God's message and say, We will obey God! Will God just forgive those mean bullies? Jonah didn't want to forgive them? Not at all. Why not? The thought of God letting them off the hook for all the bad they had done just made Jonah feel sick. I don't want God to forgive them. So what did he do? I'm out of here. Jonah ran away. Oh, no. How could he run away from God? Well, he couldn't really, but he tried. Since Nineveh was east, I'm heading west. And he went so far west that he ended up on the shore, where he found a ship. Now I don't have to deliver that message. Phew. But as soon as the ship got out to sea, a huge storm tossed the ship around. And the sailors were scared. Really, really scared! I sure would be. So the captain called out, Everyone pray so we don't die! So what did Jonah do? Nothing. Nothing? Not a thing. He was below deck. Sleeping? Until the captain found him. Hey, wake up! Oh, uh, are we there already? No, we're not there already. We're in the middle of a storm, so you better get up and pray. <laughs> Jonah felt really bad. He couldn't bring himself to pray to God. Oh, why not? Because he felt guilty. He was running from God, and he was pretty sure that God had sent the storm because of him. So he yelled out, It's my fault! Throw me into the sea, and the storm will stop! No, no, no! Well, okay. They threw Jonah into the sea, and the storm stopped. Hey, it worked! Yahoo! Even though Jonah was wrong for running from God, God wasn't trying to hurt Jonah. He wasn't? <coughs> he wasn't? Nope. God was trying to give him a second chance. Jonah was running away from God. And God knew it would take something big to turn Jonah around. So what did God do? He sent something as big as a whale. You've got to be kidding. And the whale swallowed him up. Oh, my. So I guess that's the end of the story. Not at all. God protected Jonah in the belly of the whale. And inside the belly of that whale, Jonah prayed to God and said, Okay, God, I know you want me to give those bad people a second chance. Please, give me a second chance too. And just then, <laughs> the whale spit Jonah right up. Ooh, gross. <laughs> it probably was, but now Jonah was ready to do what God had told him. So he ran to Nineveh and gave them God's message. I hope he took a bath along the way. <laughs> Maybe, but one thing we know for sure. What's that? When the people of Nineveh heard God's message, they listened, and God gave them a second chance. Just like Jonah. That's right. Isn't it great to know that God loves us so much that he gives us second chances?
Did you ever hear about God's three promises to Abraham? Yes, I have. Well, maybe, kind of, well, no. <laughs> well, a long, long time ago, God promised Abraham three things. Number one, his family would become a great nation. <laughs> Number two, they would have their very own land. The promised land. <laughs> and number three, through that nation would come a blessing for the whole world. Whoa, yay! Whoa! Pretty great promises, huh? Really great promises. But then something happened. Uh oh, what? Jerusalem was destroyed, and the Israelites were stuck in Babylon, far away from the Promised Land. So, it seemed like... None, none of those promises, promises are coming true. true! Israel was supposed to be a great nation, but now they weren't a nation at all. How could a blessing for the whole world come from Israel now? We don't know! God's promises confused the Israelites living in Babylon. They wondered if these promises would still come true and if they could still trust God. Is our story over? Is this the end? Well, God knew how confused they were. So he sent the prophet Isaiah to give them one of the most important messages in the whole Bible. In the whole Bible? What was the message? It's not the end, Isaiah said. In fact, just wait till you hear what God is going to do next. Well, the Israelites were... Super excited! Yay! Why? Because Isaiah told them about... The Messiah! Wait, what's that? The Messiah? Messiah means anointed one. Samuel had anointed young David with oil, which means that he was being set apart by God for a very special job, to be king of all Israel. And now Isaiah was saying that there was another anointed one coming. A baby will be born. He will be called Emmanuel. Emmanuel which means God with us. But he would also have another name. The baby would be from King David's family, and he would grow up to rule God's people forever. Wow, forever is like a really long time. It turns out the hope of the world wasn't a mighty nation or a big army. The hope of the world was going to be... A baby? <laughs> you got it. Now, can you guess the baby's name? Oh, I know, I know. Jesus. Remember God's three promises to Abraham? Actually, I do. His family would become a great nation. They would have their very own land, the promised land. And through that nation, a blessing would come for the whole world. Right. Well, after 1,500 years, two of those promises had come true. Amazing! And what about the third promise? You mean the promise of the blessing for the whole world? The one that promised the Messiah? The Anointed One? That's the one! Had that one come true too? Uh, no. Oh. 
Many years had passed since the time Isaiah had spoken about that promise, and the Israelites, well, you can imagine what they were saying. Where's the blessing? Where's the Messiah? Is he ever going to show up? Oh, we're, we're starting, starting to lose hope. But then, something amazing happened. Really? What? In a village called Nazareth, there was a young woman named... Mary! One day, God sent an angel to give her a special message. A special message? What was it? The angel said, You will have a son. A son? Mm-hmm. Uh, but I'm not even married. Mary wasn't married yet, but she had promised to marry a man named... Joseph! Then, the angel said something truly amazing. The baby will be a blessing for the whole world. He will be the Son of God. That's the promise they were waiting for. Yes, Mary would give birth to the Son of God, the blessing for the whole world. That's so amazing. And if you were shocked to hear about this, you can imagine what Mary must have felt like. Why, you would think she would have passed out and fallen on the floor right then. Uh. But Mary was brave. She trusted God. And she said, I am the servant of the Lord. May this happen just as you have said. Wow, Mary really trusted God. Yes, she did. Then the angel said, The baby's name will be Jesus. Was this the Messiah the people had been waiting for? <laughs> you got it! I knew it! So then what happened? Well, when it was time for the baby to be born, Joseph and Mary traveled to a place called Bethlehem. Was that a long ways away? It was. And they got there by... A donkey! That must have been hard. I think so. And on top of that, when they got to Bethlehem, they suddenly needed a place for Mary to have the baby. Oh, did they look for a hospital? <laughs> they didn't have hospitals back then. What about a palace? I mean, the Son of God should be born in the best place, right? Well... They... Or the best hotel? All the inns were full. So, what did they do? Since all the inns were full, Mary had her baby in... <laughs> A barn? A barn, the blessing that Israel had been awaiting for almost 2,000 years, was born in a... <laughs> a barn. Oh, my. Mary didn't have her baby in a fancy palace or a nice warm inn. Nope. Jesus was born in a stinky, smelly barn next to cows and sheep and goats and chickens. The promised blessing for the whole world had finally come, but he didn't arrive quite the way people expected. God kept his promise to Israel. The Messiah had come. And although he was born in a humble barn and not in a fancy palace or the best inn, God's kingdom celebrated in a most amazing way. Really? How? 
like this. Angels! A whole bunch of them showed up, and they sang and celebrated the birth of the new king. King Jesus! And where do you think God's mighty angels announced the birth of his son? Oh, I know. That's easy. They probably announced it in the biggest cities to the richest, fanciest, most important people of the whole wide world. Like kings and queens. No. Powerful generals? Ah, guess again. Oh, really rich people? <laughs> nope. Maybe this will help. <laughs> Shepherds. L look! Shepherds? Remember that God chose a humble barn for the birth of his son? Yeah, that is so weird. Right? I guess God doesn't do things the way we think he should. I guess not. So, the angels appeared in the middle of a field outside the city. That's right! They sang to shepherds. They did! Dirty, smelly guys. Hey! With dirty, smelly sheep. <laughs> well, you know what I mean. God wanted to show how his love is for everyone, even the most gentle and lowly. Yay! <laughs> Go. You will recognize the Messiah by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in a blanket and lying in a manger. Go and see him. God showed the world his power, who he really was. Not with an army, but with a baby. Not in a palace, but in a barn. Not to kings and rich people, but to us, shepherds. God's rescue plan was happening. His kingdom was on the move. He was showing that his way of working was not going to be the way that people expected. It was going to be different. Yes, that little tiny newborn baby. Born in a barn. Celebrated by shepherds. Was going to turn the whole world. Whoa! Upside down. who this is? Oh, that's baby Jesus. I can tell, because I know he was born in a barn. <laughs> yep, born in a barn instead of a palace. No one expected that. Do you know what else happened? Um, oh, a whole bunch of angels and shepherds showed up to celebrate. <laughs> and that's not even the whole story. There's more? Oh, yes. Sometime later, some wise men from the east followed a bright star in the sky to Jerusalem. They were really excited. Where can we find the newborn king? We saw his star in the sky. We want to worship him. And, and bring, bring him, him gifts, gifts, too. When the people heard about a new baby king, they got really excited, too. And soon, the news reached King Herod. There was already a king? King Herod. And he was ruler over all the land. Well, when he heard all the talk about a new king, he got a little worried. So he called his counselors together. Counselors! I need to know where the child king is supposed to be born. <laughs> In Bethlehem. 
Aha! So Herod had the wise men brought to him right away and said, As soon as you find the child, let me know because I want to worship him too. Hmm. Okay. okay. So the wise men continued on their way, following the star. That must have been so awesome! Their very own compass in the sky! That's right! Soon the star stopped over the place where Jesus was. Ooh! We saw his star in the sky. We bring gifts fit for a king. Gold. Frankincense. Myrrh. And they bowed down and worshipped him. Wow! And then they went back to tell King Herod that they have found Jesus. Nope. What? Why not? God warned the wise men not to go back to King Herod. You see, Herod didn't really want to worship Jesus. He didn't? Not at all. Herod was jealous of the new baby king. So, after the wise men left Jesus and his family, an angel spoke to Jesus' dad, Joseph, in a dream and said, Take the baby and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, because Herod is looking for the child. Phew! So, Jesus was safe? Yes, he was. Yay! Jesus would grow up with his earthly parents in a faraway land until it was time to begin the work his heavenly father had sent him to do. important moment of the entire history of the world. And I should know because I am the hopeful world. What was the most important moment in the entire history of the world? Well, it was the moment that God's people waited years and years and years and years for. Do you want to hear the story? The amazing, incredible story? When God loved the world so much that he gave his one and only son? You do? Well, great, because I'm going to tell you the whole Easter story. many important moments in this story, but it all begins with Jesus. Do you know who this is? Oh, that's baby Jesus. I can tell, because I know he was born in a barn. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. I've already told that story. How about we skip ahead a few years later when Jesus is all grown up doing amazing things all over the place. Jesus and his disciples went all over Israel, showing everyone what the kingdom of God was like. Do you know how he did that? <laughs> oh, that's easy. By teaching them. Well, yes, but also by doing amazing, unbelievable, incredible, unimaginable things called miracles. 
But, uh, what's a miracle? Miracles are signs that show people how powerful Jesus is. Let me tell you about three of his miracles. One night, Jesus was on a boat with his disciples when... Oh no! A huge storm has taken over the sea! We're going to sink! We're going to die! What are we going to do? Meanwhile, Jesus was... Sleeping? Like a baby. So, one of the disciples said... Uh, excuse me? Excuse me, Jesus? Yes? What is it? We're all going to die! So, Jesus sat up and said... Hmm, why are you so afraid? Then, he turned to the giant storm and said... Stop! And guess what happened? The storm stopped. Wow! Jesus spoke to the storm and it obeyed him. Yep. Jesus was showing his disciples that in the kingdom of God, we have nothing to fear because... Jesus is the king of everything. Yes, he is. Another time, Jesus was surrounded by thousands of people who had followed him far away from town with no food to eat. Boy, am I hungry. Me too. Wish I'd brought a snack. Wish I'd brought two snacks. So, one of the disciples asked Jesus, Uh, excuse me, Jesus. Uh, how are we gonna feed all these people? Will this help? Five loaves of bread and two small fish? <laughs> Five loaves, two... <laughs> You can't feed thousands of people with this. Are you sure? Hmm. But Jesus took the boy's gift and prayed over it. Then he started breaking pieces off and giving them to the people. And then there were more pieces. And more pieces. And more pieces. So many pieces that... Look! Every person got to eat as much as they wanted. Another miracle! The disciples must have been so surprised. Oh, they were. Jesus was giving them another sign. In God's kingdom, there is always enough. Enough food, enough warmth, enough love. Because Jesus is the king of everything. You're catching on. And another time, a desperate man ran to Jesus saying, my daughter is sick and dying. Can you please help her? By the time Jesus got to their house, the little girl had died. Oh, no! But Jesus said, Don't worry. She's okay. And the little girl came back to life, just like that. This was a sign that Jesus is king over sickness and disease. Jesus is the king of everything! Yes, he is. In the kingdom of God, there is no sickness or death. People must have been so excited. Oh, they were. But not all of them. Who wouldn't be excited about the miracles? I'll tell you. The religious leaders, the Pharisees. <laughs> We keep track of all the rules, and we're not excited at all. Yeah, Jesus is getting too popular. Some people even call him a king. We gotta do something about this. So, the Pharisees went to the Sadducees. We're the ones in charge of punishing the people that break the rules. Let's talk. <laughs> The Pharisees and Sadducees didn't like all the amazing miracles Jesus was doing. How could they not be amazed by the miracles? Because they were too afraid Jesus would take over their jobs. Jesus is the king over everything. That's right. And God was about to use him to do the most incredible miracle of all time. Really? 
Yep. So the Pharisees and Sadducees began looking for a way to arrest Jesus, to stop him from doing the work his father had sent him to do. They tried to stop Jesus from what God wanted him to do. Hmm, those Pharisees and Sadducees were really sneaky. Oh, and the incredible thing that God was going to do? What do you think that could be? It was an even more incredible miracle than making blind people see in calming storms. You'll have to wait and see what that miracle was, because first Jesus and his disciples traveled to a celebration. It was time for Jesus and his disciples to celebrate the Passover. Passover? What is Passover? Do you remember when God sent Moses to rescue the Israelites from Egypt? Oh, yes. God sent frogs and flies and darkness and other things. It was pretty crazy. It was. God sent plague after plague, ten plagues. But Pharaoh still refused to let God's people go. He said, No, I will not let God's people go. So it was time for Pharaoh to see just how powerful God can be. What happened next? God told Moses to have every Israelite family prepare a lamb for a special meal, and then take some of the blood from that lamb and put it over the door of their houses. Why would God tell them to do that? Because, for the last plague, God would send an angel to take the life of every firstborn son of the Egyptians. The angel would pass over the homes of the Israelites who had the blood of the lamb over their doors. So, the blood of the lamb saved the sons of the Israelites. And ever since that day, the Israelites have celebrated Passover with a special meal just like the one they had that night in Egypt when the angel passed over their homes many, many years earlier. I get it now. So, Jesus and his disciples traveled to Jerusalem where many people gathered to celebrate Passover. And something very wonderful happened when he got there. Oh, really? What? As Jesus rode into the city on a donkey, a a big crowd of people came to meet him. They knew who he was? Yes, they were so excited. They waved palm branches and then laid them down in front of him. That's funny. What did they do that for? It was their way of honoring Jesus. Like a welcome mat. That's so cool. And then they shouted, Hosanna! Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! It was like a parade. A parade for a king. Everyone was so happy. Wait! 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 Stop everything! We're not happy at all. Not one teeny bit. Ah, yes. The Pharisees and Sadducees. Those religious leaders weren't happy. They were very nervous. Hey! Jesus is such a troublemaker. If the Romans hear people calling him king, they will send their soldiers to throw us in prison. We need to stop Jesus and his followers. So they came up with a secret plan to hurt Jesus. Oh no, they can't hurt Jesus. Don't worry, even this was part of God's plan. Later that night, Jesus and his disciples got together to eat the Passover meal, just like they did every year. But this year was different. During the meal, Jesus got up and washed his disciples' feet to show them what it really means to love and serve others. Then, Jesus said something that surprised them all. One of you is going to turn against me. Oh no! Why did he say that? Uh, he knew that one of them was helping the Pharisees and Sadducees. <gasps> Were the disciples surprised? For sure. They looked at each other and said, Who could it be? Jesus knew what was going to happen. 
He wanted to prepare his followers, so he took a piece of bread and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Then he picked up his cup and said, This cup is the new covenant of my blood, poured out for you. What did he mean by that? What does cov... cov... Covenant. What does that mean? A covenant is a promise. Many years before, God had made a covenant, a promise, to bless his people. Now, Jesus was saying that God was going to make a new covenant with them. He was going to bless them in a new way. But when he said, This is my body, this is my blood, it sounded like this new covenant had something to do with Jesus dying. And it did. What do you mean? Why would Jesus have to die? Remember when the angel in Egypt saw the blood of the lamb over the door? What did he do? Um, he passed over the house. And the people were safe. Jesus was saying that now his body and blood would save them. He was saying that he was the new Passover lamb. Whoa! The disciples could not believe their ears. Then, after dinner, Jesus took some of his disciples and went to a garden to pray. He knew what he had to do next, and he knew it was not going to be easy. After a while, he said, The hour has come. And just at that moment, one of his disciples arrived, leading a group of soldiers sent by the Sadducees to arrest Jesus. Which disciple was it? The disciple named Judas. Now everyone knew who had turned against Jesus. With the help of Judas, the Pharisees and Sadducees arrested Jesus. <gasps> Just like they planned. But you know what? Things did not go the way they planned. I told you those Pharisees and Sadducees were sneaky. They turned Jesus' own friend Judas against him. And Judas helped them arrest Jesus. It must have been so scary and sad for all the other disciples. But Jesus loves us so much he knew what he had to do. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. The Pharisees and Sadducees thought they were stopping Jesus from doing all those miracles, but boy oh boy, were they wrong. Jesus was going around doing the work God had sent him to do, healing people <laughs> and teaching them all about the kingdom of God. But the Pharisees and Sadducees thought Jesus was getting too popular, so they had him arrested in the middle of the night. Oh no! What did they do to him? They asked him a lot of questions. Are you the Son of God? Do you think you are equal to God? Jesus didn't say anything, but the religious leaders didn't care if he answered or not. They accused him anyway. He is guilty of blasphemy! 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 Blasphemy? What does that even mean? Blasphemy is when someone says untrue things about God. The Pharisees and Sadducees accused Jesus of saying he was God. According to the Pharisees and Sadducees, there was only one way a person could pay for that. What was it? Going to jail? No, death. No! There was a problem for the Pharisees and Sadducees, though. What? Even if the Pharisees and Sadducees said Jesus was guilty, they weren't allowed to kill anyone. Only Roman leaders could do that. So they took him to the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate. Wait, what? Pancho the Pilate? Not a Pilate, Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor. 
that when he saw Jesus and his accusers, he was a little confused. <laughs> Are they upset? <laughs> what have you done that has made everyone so angry? Again, Jesus didn't say anything. So Pilate turned to the religious leaders and said, I don't see anything wrong with this man. Well, according to our rules, he needs to die. Now, Pilate had a problem. Hmm. Jesus doesn't deserve to die. But, but if he gets more popular, I don't want the Pharisees and Sadducees to complain about me to the other Roman leaders. So, what did he do? He thought there was only one way to keep his job as Roman governor. Hmm. Well, what are you going to do? Uh, bring me some water. I wash my hands of this situation. This is not my fault. So, Pilate ordered that Jesus be killed on a wooden cross. Because... According to our laws, he deserves to die. <gasps> That is so sad. Jesus didn't deserve to die on the cross. No, he didn't. But he went to the cross anyway. And as he was dying, he continued to show love and mercy by saying, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they are doing. The sky turned very dark, and Jesus said, It is finished. Jesus died. Then the ground began to shake, and a Roman guard standing nearby said, This man must have been the Son of God. But where were the disciples? All of Jesus' friends. His mother was with him, and a few of his friends. The others probably didn't know what to think. How could Jesus be the Messiah? the blessing for the whole world, if he wasn't even alive. This part is sad. I know that Jesus had to die so he could heal the whole world from sin. But it is still so, so sad. <sighs> Jesus gave his life for us, and it was only the beginning of the most amazing miracle of all. Jesus had done some amazing things while he was living. Like lots of miracles. That's right. Stop! And He'd shown everyone that God the Father was very loving and good and powerful. He had also promised that the kingdom of God was near. He'd given everyone a taste of that kingdom through those miracles. What's the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God is when the whole world will be made new again, the way God had always wanted it to be. Jesus promised that someday, in the kingdom of God, there will be no sin or sadness or sickness or death. What is sin again? Sin is when we ignore God and go our own way. Sin is when we say, I don't care what you say. I'm going to do it my way. And remember, because God is good and sin is bad, the price we pay for our sin is being apart from God. Oh, so in the kingdom of God, there will be no sin, or sadness, or sickness. In the kingdom of God, there will be nothing to be afraid of, not even death. But Jesus had just died. Ah, so it seemed like none of those promises were coming true. But that was not the case. Really? What do you mean? You see, something more amazing was happening that Jesus' enemies didn't realize. When he died on the cross, Jesus took all of our sin on himself. He did? You see, 
Since our sin turns us away from God, there can be no sin in the kingdom of God. So, Jesus had to fix the problem of sin. And he did that by dying on the cross? Yes. By dying on the cross, Jesus paid the price for our sins. Yours, mine, everyone's. Wow! Jesus really loves us. He sure does. But... Another question? What about all the things that he said about the kingdom? I still don't get it. If Jesus was dead, how could any of those promises come true? That's a really good question. With an even better answer. Because he didn't stay dead. Jesus didn't stay dead? That sounds like a pretty incredible miracle to me. I told you this story was amazing, and he paid the price for all of our sins. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Now, where were we? Oh, right, the sad part. Jesus had died after his own friend Judas turned against him. Jesus had been betrayed. He was arrested and put to death on a cross. It was a sad day. Yes, Jesus gave his life for us. The sun had gone down, and it was time to bury him. Only his mom and a few friends were there. You remembered. So, what did they do? They got help from a man. I am Joseph, from Arimathea, a follower of Jesus. I am very sad that Jesus has died. I have been waiting for the kingdom he spoke of to come. I want to do something nice for him, to show Jesus how much I loved him. So Joseph did something special. He went to Pontius Pilate. I want to take care of Jesus' body. I want to give him a grave. All right, go ahead. Now, when important people died in Israel, they were not buried in the ground. Really? No, their bodies were placed in special tombs that were carved out of solid rock. Do you mean like a cave? Like a small cave. Well, Joseph had one that he was going to use someday, but guess what? He decided to give it to Jesus. So, Jesus' body was placed inside Joseph's tomb, and then a big rock was rolled in front of the cave, so no one could get in. And then... Someone is here to see you, Pilate. Oh, it's you again. Yep. We're back! You didn't think we'd give up that easily, did you? Uh, what do you want? Look, Jesus said that he would come back from the dead. And? Well, what if his friends go to the tomb, move the rock, and take his body and then say, Jesus is alive! Hmm. That would cause a lot of trouble for you, Pilot. Hmm, I never thought of that. So Pilot put guards outside the tomb to make sure no one moved the rock. Eyes peeled. We don't want anyone to move this rock. Yeah, no one's gonna get past us. No, sir. Wow, so the Pharisees and the Sadducees were still worried about Jesus? Yep. You see, when Jesus was alive, he said, In three days, I will rise from the dead. Well, Jesus had died and was buried on a Friday. That's day one. All day Saturday, his body lay in Joseph's tomb with the guards keeping watch. That was day two? Right. So Sunday morning comes around. Day three. 
and two women who were Jesus' friends made their way to the tomb to put spices and perfume on his body, because that was something that people did in those days. When all of a sudden... Ah! Whoa, whoa, whoa! What happened? What happened? An earthquake shook the ground, and an angel appeared. <laughs> the angel rolled away the rock. When the women arrived, there lay the two soldiers, passed out on the ground. There lay the rock, and there, well, there was no Jesus. <gasps> Don't be afraid. Oh, uh, okay. I know you're looking for Jesus, but he isn't here. He has risen, just like he said he would. Jesus is alive. What? What? The women were so excited. They wanted to go tell their other friends what happened, when suddenly... Don't be afraid. Jesus showed up? He sure did. No way! Yes way. Later, Jesus appeared to all his disciples. He explained to them why he had to die. He told them the great news that death has no power in God's kingdom. And then, when it was time for him to leave, he said, From now on, you will be the ones telling others about my kingdom. I will send you a helper who will fill you with the power of God. You will do amazing things. And then, Jesus rose up into the sky. Amazing! The disciples were very excited. They didn't really know what would happen next, but they knew one thing. Jesus was sending them a helper who would help them in a mighty big way. He's alive! He's alive! Jesus is alive! He defeated sin and death! Hallelujah! Jesus saved the whole world from sin, and God wasn't done yet. Jesus said he would send a helper so his friends could do incredibly amazing things too. But that's a whole nother story we'll save for another day. This is the story of Easter, when God gave his one and only son because he loved the world so much. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Jerusalem was packed. People from all over the Roman Empire were visiting for a celebration. But 
Jesus' disciples were nowhere to be found. Really? Why? You see, after Jesus died on the cross, they had gotten some good news and some sad news. What was the good news? Jesus was alive! Yes, yes, yes! That was good news! And, uh, what was the sad news? Jesus was going to leave them. Oh. But there was also some other good news. Good! Oh, double good! What was it? It was time for Jesus' friends to spread the good news about his kingdom. But that's a ginormous job. Which is why Jesus left them with even more good news. Jesus promised to send his followers a helper. A helper? Who? No one knew. So, for the time being, Jesus' friends hid in Jerusalem, waiting and praying. They hid? They didn't want the Pharisees and Sadducees coming after them like they had come after Jesus. So they were trying very hard not to attract too much attention. I get it. One day passed, then two, then... We've been praying for three days and still no sign of the Helper. What should we do? What Jesus told us to do. I guess. So they continued to pray. Four days passed. Five, six, seven, eight. It's been nine days. What should we do? Then, on the tenth day, boom! Boom? A sound like a huge wind filled the house. And something that looked like little flames of fire appeared over their heads. Ah! What was it? The Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit. Whoa! Was the Holy Spirit the helper Jesus promised? Yes, the helper had come. Amazing! And something even more amazing happened, because as the disciples were filled with God's Spirit, they began to praise God, and... Great is the Lord, and Horodovan Burstogast! Huh? What did you say? Horodovan Burstogast! Bashi on the story Espisur! Hey, how do you know that language? Everyone in the room began speaking in different languages that they did not know. Whoa! That was really helpful because, remember, during those days, people from all over the Roman world were visiting Jerusalem. Suddenly, they were hearing all about Jesus in their own language. It was a miracle! Hey, everybody! Have I got news for you! Wait, I thought Jesus' friends were all hiding. Not anymore. God's helper helped them to be brave. Peter boldly told the people all about Jesus. And guess what? There's more? <laughs> oh, yes. The crowd was so amazed with Peter's message that, well, guess how many of them became followers of Jesus that day? Oh, uh, let's see. Ten? <laughs> Higher. Twenty? Higher. Thirty? Forty? Sixty? One hundred? Three thousand! What? Yep. Then, Jesus' disciples started bravely talking about Jesus all over Jerusalem. Everyone must have been amazed. They were, except for, well, you know who? Yep, still us. The Pharisees and Sadducees, and just as grumpy as ever. Hey! You better stop talking about Jesus or... or... or we'll arrest you! They threatened the disciples, but the disciples went on telling people about Jesus anyway. Because Jesus sent them the helper? 
Yes, for the first time ever, God's spirit and power were available for all of Jesus' followers. And with that power, they would go out and change the world. Jesus' disciples were very busy in Jerusalem. The Holy Spirit had come and they were boldly sharing the good news. Jesus died for our sins. With everybody. I'd like to follow Jesus. I'd like to follow Jesus too. Wow, so many followers. Yep, and now it was time to spread the good news all over the Roman world. How would they do that? Oh. God had someone special in mind for the job. Peter? Nope. John? No. Andrew? Matthew? James? Simon? Bartholomew? <laughs> no. It was a man named... Saul. Also known as... Paul. Saul was his Hebrew name. But outside of Israel, people knew him as Paul. So Saul was Paul? Yep. And he was also... A Pharisee. <gasps> and like all good Pharisees, I want to make sure everybody follows all the rules, all the time. Remember, the Pharisees thought Jesus was breaking all the rules. So, they had worked with the Sadducees to have him arrested. They wanted to hurt Jesus, and they did. Right. Well, Saul was so concerned about the rules that after Jesus died, he made it his job to... Arrest him! Arrest her! Arrest them! I'm making it my job to arrest as many of Jesus' followers as I can. Ha 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 ha! So Saul, who was Paul, was a Pharisee? And an enemy of Jesus. But how could God use an enemy of Jesus to spread the good news about him all over the world? Because even though Paul was going one way, God was about to turn him around. How? By stopping him in his tracks. You see, one day, Saul was traveling to a town called Damascus, hoping to find more of Jesus' disciples. I'm gonna arrest them. I'm gonna lock them up. I'm gonna. When arrest suddenly, them. a bright light hit him right in the face. Oh! A bright light? A very bright light. And then a voice from heaven said, Saul, why are you trying to hurt me? Who was it? That's what Saul wanted to know. And the voice replied, I am Jesus, the one you are trying to hurt. Jesus was talking to Saul? Uh, I mean, Paul? Wow, he must have been so surprised. And even more so when he realized that I can't see. I can't see a thing. Suddenly, Saul was blind. Then, Jesus told him to go to Damascus anyway and wait there. Why? Because Jesus had a follower there named... Ananias. Jesus spoke to Ananias in a dream and told him to go find Saul. You mean the man that came to arrest us? The one who hasn't stopped making trouble? That mean man? Why do you want me to find him? Then Jesus said, He is the one I'm going to use to spread the good news about me to everyone, to Jews and those that aren't Jews, and even to kings. So what did Ananias do? He trusted Jesus. 
So when he found Saul, he prayed for him and something amazing happened. I can see! I can see! Wow! Then something even more amazing happened. What? Saul became a follower of Jesus. Double wow! And then something even way more amazing happened. What could that be? Hey, hey, Jesus is the Son of God. Hey, you, Jesus is the Son of God. He started telling everyone about Jesus. So Saul went from being Jesus' enemy to being Paul, Jesus' friend. And more importantly, a disciple. I've got to tell everybody about Jesus. Anywhere, everywhere. Whatever Paul did, he did with his whole heart. And now that he met Jesus, he was ready for God to use him to turn the Roman world whoa, upside down. Saul? You mean Saul, who was also Paul, but Jesus appeared to him and changed his life forever. So he ran around telling everyone about Jesus? That's the one. God really knew what he was doing when he chose him. <laughs> he sure did. First of all, Paul was really smart. As a Pharisee, he had spent years studying and memorizing God's law and the stories of Israel. Second, he spoke Hebrew, the language of Israel. Shalom! And he also spoke Greek, the language of the Roman Empire. Hirete! And there was one more thing that made Paul perfect for the job. Really? What? He was a Roman citizen, which meant... I can travel anywhere! Paul could go everywhere in the Roman world and talk to anyone about... Jesus! Right. So, Paul grabbed his things and... I'm hitting the road. Ciao! See ya! Because of Paul's travels, groups of Jesus followers were popping up everywhere. They were given a new name, Christians, which means little Christs. And they began meeting together in groups we now call churches. Wow! How great is that? Very great. Though it wasn't always great. It wasn't? Sometimes Paul was attacked by people that wanted him to stop talking about Jesus. Other times he was arrested and thrown in jail. That... that's terrible! Yes, but God helped Paul in those hard times. Really? Yep. One time he was on a ship, and guess what happened? Uh-oh. Don't tell me it sank. It did. It did. But Paul and the crew made it to an island where the local people helped them. Phew. That was nice. It was. But then, as Paul was building a fire, he got bit by... <gasps> a poisonous a snake! Oh no, a snake? That's really terrible! He's a goner! But you know what Paul did? He trusted God. He shook the snake off and kept on working. He did? Uh-huh. When nothing happened to Paul, the people realized that they had seen... A miracle! They were so excited that they brought sick people to Paul and... God healed them! So, you see, even in the hard times, Paul was filled with joy. God gave Paul the strength to be happy if he was full or if he was hungry, if he had money or if he had none. If he was free 
or if he was in jail. No matter how many hard things happened to Paul, he could be happy knowing God was with him. The Pharisees and the Sadducees, on the other hand, were not happy. And you know why. Paul was supposed to be arresting Jesus' followers. Yes, but instead he was helping churches grow all over the place. So, the Pharisees and Sadducees had Paul thrown in jail. And there, he found out something really bad. Uh-oh! What? They were planning to kill him. <gasps> That's the most terrible... What did Paul do? I am a Roman citizen. I appeal unto Caesar. Appeal to Caesar? What does that mean? I'll explain. Remember that Paul was a Roman citizen? By appealing to Caesar, the Roman ruler at the time, he was asking for Roman protection. So, Paul was sent all the way to Rome, where Caesar lived. Now, all he had to do was wait for his turn to tell Caesar about Jesus. But Caesar was a little busy, so Paul sat in jail for two whole years. Two years? What did he do all that time? Since he couldn't go out and tell people about Jesus... I wrote letters. Letters? Yes. Lots of letters that help churches learn how to be followers of Jesus. You've probably seen some of Paul's letters in the Bible, like Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians. Oh, what's Philippians about? That one was all about joy, and it was written to the Christians in Philippi. Because Paul was full of joy, no matter what. It sure sounds like he stayed busy. <laughs> yes, busy for Jesus, even when he was in jail. Wow, God really helped Paul turn something that was terrible into something very good. Yes, he did. He sure did. When Paul was in jail in Rome, he had a lot of time on his hands. Since he couldn't go out and tell people about Jesus, he wrote lots of letters to help the churches. Yes, you remembered. And in one of those letters, Paul wrote, We are justified by grace through faith. Something wrong? It's just that, well... I have no idea what that means. Oh, that's okay. Some of Paul's letters were a little hard to understand. I'll explain what Paul meant when he said, We are justified by grace through faith. <laughs> Let's begin with the word justified. Let's say someone goes to the store to get some bananas. These bananas are great! Put the bananas down. Okay. You didn't pay for those bananas. I sure did. You heard the alarm. You did not. I did. Did not. You are wrong. I am? No, she's right. Here's the receipt. She paid for the bananas. It's right for her to take them home. Oh, I see. So, she's not wrong. She's right. She is justified. It's justified done nothing wrong. It seemed like the girl did something wrong, but the owner said that what she did was right. So, she was justified. Right. And what about grace? What does that mean? The word grace means undeserved favor. Those are just more big words. I still don't get it. Well, favor means kindness. So grace or 
undeserved favor means you have been given a kindness, a gift that you didn't earn. For example, I finished mowing the lawn, Grandpa. And you've done a great job. Here's the money I said I'd pay you. Yahoo! Did the boy deserve that money? For sure. He earned it. Yes, he did. Now, what if this happens? You're such a wonderful grandson. Here's a little money for you to buy something you like. It's just a gift because I love you. Wow! Thanks, Grandpa! Did the boy earn the money this time? No, the money was a gift. Right, and that's exactly what Grace is. A gift that you didn't earn. And what is the gift that Paul was talking about that we haven't earned? Well, it's much better than money. The gift we haven't earned is friendship with God. Friendship with God? Yes, a forever kind of friendship. Today, tomorrow, and someday in a world without sadness or sickness. A world made right. That sounds amazing! It is! God wants to spend forever with us. And only one thing will keep us away from this forever kind of friendship. What is that? Sin. Remember that sin turns us away from God. It breaks our friendship with Him. To be friends with God, we need to have our labels changed from wrong to right. Like the girl in the supermarket. Yes. But you see, we can't change our own labels. That is why Jesus came. It's why he died on the cross. When Jesus took our sins, he took our labels that said wrong and put them on himself. Then he took his own label that said right and put it on us. Jesus justified us. Wow, Jesus loves us so much. He does. And because of what he did, we are... Justified! By grace through faith. And what is faith? Faith is trusting that Jesus will do what he said he would do. Faith is believing the good news about Jesus and the forever kind of friendship that we can have with him. Our labels are changed from wrong to right. Right. Wow, I'm so glad Jesus loves us so much. <laughs>